Any building, site, or district in the city of Milwaukee with some architectural, cultural, or historic significance may be considered for historic designation. There are many possibilities. It has, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright did buildings here. Uh, Milwaukee has a very, very beautiful design history. Our buildings are so gorgeous and our housing is so beautiful. Places like Sherman Park, Walker's Point, uh, Brewer's Hill, Bayview, places like that that uh, it's important to preserve it. It's one of the greatest assets that the city has in addition to our people. The city currently has about 1,500 locally designated properties and about another uh, 1,800 national register sites. Um, basically that uh, comprises about 1% of the city's building stock which is protected in, in one form or another. You might think of Milwaukee City Hall, built in 1895 in a Flemish Renaissance design when historic preservation is mentioned, or perhaps the Pabst Mansion, 1890, German Renaissance Revival. But the Prior Avenue Artesian Well, nearly 120 years old, also has a historic designation. So does this, the last horse-watering trough in the city near 16th and Burnham. And there are areas, like historic Mitchell Street, once called the Polish Grand Avenue, one of 22 districts with the designation. Mitchell Street's a historic district because of the unique uh, differences in the architecture. Basically, the, the block came into being between 1870 and 1940, so there's a large mix of architectural buildings here in terms of various styles and time periods. Uh, the buildings also have a tendency to relate well to each other, and that's what gives the, the neighborhood its, its unique character. The districts are actually created uh, without regard to the businesses on the street uh, because tenants come and go over time, but the buildings have a lasting impression on the neighborhood and the stability of the neighborhood as well. In this particular neighborhood, it's, it's really nice to see two large churches, the, uh, the Romanesque revival building behind us and the one just, just behind me, which is St. Anthony's, which is a, a Gothic revival building. McKinley Boulevard from 27th to 35th Streets is a residential area with a historic designation. The seven blocks show a prosperous upper middle class of the early 20th century. The boulevard was Milwaukee's second, dating to 1906. Highland was the first. The neighborhood itself is historic be because of several items. One is the architecture and the other is the, the, uh, its location. I mean, historically, it was the uh, location of the state fair and also of a racetrack that was, was here in the area for, for trotters. When the commission looks at a district designation, they look at both the history and the architecture combined. And this was just a very unusual and very unique uh, neighborhood. The architecture here is basically of the Queen Anne Victorian vintage in terms of its massing, its size, two stories, two and a half stories tall. And then it takes influences from uh, four or five other known architectural uh, periods or time periods. They're all mixed in here. And what's unusual is this entire neighborhood was basically built in a six-year time period between 1900 and 1915. So it's kind of unusual to see this many different types of architectural flavor in, this, in, in such a short time period. You might not think the bungalow is especially historic, but 24 homes in the 2500 block of North 47th Street in Sherman Park make up a historic district, the newest one in the city. Even most of the garages match the design and character of the homes. Bungalows, by their very nature, are very small, quaint houses. This entire neighborhood, which is our 22nd historic district, was built in a six-year time period between 1922 and 1928. So the houses all have some very um, unique yet similar design features. They have uh, porches that, are, that, that appear to be enclosed, creating foyer areas. Uh, they're designed with very um, expensive building materials. I mean, when you typically think of a bungalow, you think of basically a wood structure that's um, for the uh, more modest of means. And these were all designed 
with large lots, 50-foot lots, which makes this district in this particular block very unusual, gives it more, uh, a more spacious character, and they were designed with very expensive materials. There, as you look around the neighborhood, you'll see copper gutters, you'll see slate roofs, uh, you'll see some stained glass, um, a lot of very quality building materials, and a lot of these uh, houses contain brick or stucco, which are more often attributed to the uh, more expensive uh, housing styles. The other thing that's kind of unusual is when this was developed, it was developed by one single developer, and he actually placed restrictive covenants on this property, much as you do now in the suburbs, to make sure that the quality and the setbacks and the materials would be consistent throughout the neighborhood. The Milwaukee Historic Preservation Commission is responsible for historic designations in the city. Nine members appointed by the mayor and common council for their interest and skills in historic preservation. One recent recommendation involved the home of the only major beekeeper in Milwaukee, the producer of Honeyacre products. Honey processing was not a common business in Milwaukee County, and the fact that uh, a well-known sort of household name brand is associated with this function here in the city of Milwaukee is of significance to Milwaukee's economic history. The English cottage uh, revival style is not unique uh, to Milwaukee, and this is not the only example of its kind in Milwaukee, but it is an extremely well-crafted building uh, whose exterior makes use of quality details the Historic Preservation Commission considers nine criteria in its decisions which follow a thorough review. Its recommendations are sent to the Common Council for a final decision. For that reason, an alderman is one of its members. Good for them to have that uh, link between one, and no one another. As well, I think it's always good for the Commission to learn um, that they need constituents to be first, to let them know that uh, people make decisions every day based on uh, what they decide and that it's important to take their input. I think what is most important for the Commission is to educate those who live in historically designated areas or in buildings that are historically designated and let them know exactly what their rights are, what the expectations are of them, and uh, to give them some help in uh, deciding on materials and design and other things. It's important that people realize that there, there's an outside independent Commission making decisions that are beyond economics, that are beyond land use, to, uh, to preserve our history. When it goes to the Common Council, however, the Common Council can take into account economics. Oftentimes, I think the people have the misperception that repairs on historic buildings are more expensive, and in fact, they're not. They may be different, different materials, different artisans, but the price usually is not that much higher. Public outrage over demolition of the Plankenton Mansion at 15th and Wisconsin in 1980 led to formation of the Historic Preservation Commission. A warehouse in Walker's Point now houses artifacts from the Plankenton and other structures. They were salvaged by the Milwaukee Redevelopment Authority, and putting the pieces back together wasn't easy. Uh, there weren't any plans, there weren't any drawings that we really had to work from, but we did have um, clues to go on, such as a, a few paper stickers here and there, and then we matched up things like shellac lines, the types of wood, because each room was of a different species of wood, um, shellac lines, um, screw holes, um, and just a general knowledge of how woodwork uh, was put together in an old house. Uh, were all things we had to use with every single piece that we reassembled. So it was a little bit like a, uh, a puzzle and, and also kind of like a treasure chest, I suppose. This staircase was built right around 1885, and it's a really splendid example. It's a, like a castle quality woodwork. It's made of something called rift sawn white oak. And it's one of the reasons why people like the old golden oak woodwork. So it really is a very fine example of Milwaukee's best craftsmanship from the 19th century. We have leaded glass. Uh, we have um, bathroom fixtures. We have just about everything uh, major in terms of uh, uh, fittings that would have gone into an old home. Uh, but of course the key in the, in, in, to the collection I think is the very fine woodwork um, and, uh, and also um, probably the very fine light fixtures that we have as well. The, the mansions, the two mansions that are represented um, in our collection here, the Henry Eline Mansion and Elizabeth Plankenton Mansion, are kind of the epitome of the architectural and artistic development uh, of the city in the 1880s and it helps to 
to perpetuate the people whose mansions these came from. And it's also um, a good way to preserve what was the best of the best in many respects of, of architectural development and cr the, the development of craftsmanship in the city. Huge oriental style lanterns are among the salvaged treasures. They come from the old Plankenden Hotel, demolished in 1980 for construction of the Grand Avenue Mall. The idea is to have these items reused in a meaningful way in public places where they can be enjoyed and appreciated. The Milwaukee Arts Board will help with that decision. Its chairman is Alderman Michael Murphy. And they're really pieces of art history of the city of Milwaukee, something that we want to maintain in the city. So our preference is working with the Department of City Development that those artworks either one, stay within the public spaces, for example, they'll be put into public lobby spaces, spaces where the city's building new public facilities. Two, if they are not able to make it in that location, that projects that we finance through TIFs or other financing mechanisms, they'll be put in the public lobby spaces. If that doesn't occur, we have consignments that where they're consigned to basically be purchased through city residents in this community or Milwaukee County area. And finally, if all else doesn't occur where the product, the uh, artifacts are not sold, that perhaps we'll even put them up on like so, somewhat like an eBay. But there'll be a, a four criteria process that we'll go through and the Arts Board will work cooperatively with the Department of City Development on that. Um, we need to recognize that when we're throwing away certain things, that we're throwing away part of our history. And it's important to save some of that and, and have a perspective on it. And so historic preservation um, that came about over 20 years ago recognized the importance of maintaining the structures of this community and the buildings that are important of our history. And Arts Board recognizes that also. Exterior remodeling can cause loss of historic character for old buildings. So when a property is designated as historic, any changes to the exterior require a certificate of appropriateness from the commission. Um, basically, property owners are asked to maintain their properties and not to change them in a way that would uh, look uncharacteristic of the neighborhood. Um, one of the things that uh, people are often doing is um, replacing railings and doors and windows. And you can do that in a very sensitive way and still maintain the character of the building. Architecture and preservation go hand in hand and um, preserving that history is considered to be in the best interest of the community and the welfare of its citizens. Um, I like to think that only by knowing your past can you direct your future. It's getting to be that time of year again. As construction season nears, it's time to think again about revising your drive. Starting April 9th, there will be full-time lane and ramp closures on 15 miles of northbound Highway 45 as the Wisconsin Department of Transportation repairs the freeway. Well, we, we're really asking the help of the public out on the road. We need to divert about 40% of the traffic off of the highway and work will be uh, extending from Lincoln Avenue on Highway 45, 894, all the way up to County Highway Q in Waukesha, Washington County line and we'll be doing pavement repairs and uh, we will be having uh, some ramp closures. Uh, we'll also be doing lane closures out there. We'll have one lane closed pretty much full time. A good share of our work is going to be done at, at night. Uh, that's when we'll be taking traffic down to uh, one lane northbound uh, and that's typically on weekdays uh, between 8 p.m. at night and 6 a.m. in the morning and uh, we'll also be impacting uh, traffic extending through the zoo interchange for a short period. That traffic reduced down to one lane of traffic. How will the city of Milwaukee streets be affected by this construction? Our Department of Public Works expects some increased traffic on streets within the city limits and will be monitoring it. But officials say there weren't too many problems on city streets during construction on the southbound lanes last year and they're hoping for a similar situation in 2001. Uh, we're expecting pretty much the same as what happened last year. We're not looking at having to do a lot of additional work. 
A lot of the work that was done last year we left in place and it's ready to go again this year at the start of the construction season in April. We did a minimal amount of work, particularly up on the far northwest side where traffic definitely was heavier too, but with the things that we did up there in terms of adding new traffic signals, we were pretty much able to handle a lot of the traffic increase that happened there without a heck of a lot of problems. Among the work done last year, the city changed the timing of some traffic signals in the far northwest side to accommodate the increased traffic. Traffic signals were added along 107th Street north of Good Hope Road. Traffic again was heavier in some of the areas in Wauwatosa and West Dallas where a lot of the work has been concentrated, but pretty much on the roadways that were in the city, we didn't have to worry too much about a lot of, uh, a lot of different traffic problems that occurred during that construction season. While not expecting too many problems on Milwaukee streets, the Public Works Department is preparing for a couple of new challenges on streets adjoining the freeway within the city limits. Uh, we're going to pay particular attention to a couple areas. One is in the area of State Fair Park and the areas north include Glenview, uh, 92nd, Blue Mountain Road area, particularly when they do the work in the zoo interchange and they're going to be closing a couple of ramps down there. If traffic attempts to use the 84th Street ramps or the Highway 100 ramps to in there, we'll be paying a close watch to that to make sure that we don't create traffic problems on city streets or if congestion occurs to be able to address those problems and, and come up with some measures to relieve the problems that happened there. County Hospital was another concern last year too and uh, there was no access on Watertown Plank Road. They came down to the south through Wisconsin Avenue and that experienced a little more traffic. So we're going to be paying attention to that again to see if there's anything that's going to be necessary to get that traffic back onto the freeway system and get it out of the area in general. Uh, up on 107th, 91st Street, and 76th Street up on the northwest side is another area that we're going to be paying attention to. Uh, in those cases, we've got the signals that are going to stay on in the 107th again, and we'll be monitoring the traffic flow in those particular areas to see if additional changes in traffic signals are going to be necessary over there to aid the traffic getting through. Uh, one thing that may help traffic up on the northwest side this year is the completion of the construction in the north interchange on Highway 45. 124th Street is now open to traffic from roughly Fond du Lac Avenue north to Brown Deer. So that'll add another north-south route in that corridor for traffic to go to and it may take some of the pressure off of 107th and 91st like what we saw last year. So expect some more traffic on streets within city limits but it's roads like Mayfair and Wauwatosa that will probably bear much of the burden. The kiosk at Mayfair Mall will again give shoppers an idea of traffic on the freeway with live pictures. Signs along Highway 100, Mayfair Road, will let you know if a nearby freeway ramp is closed or open. In addition, the state has taken other steps to help deal with the construction. The Sheriff's Department will be deploying enhanced freeway patrols. You can check the DOT website for information on lane and ramp closures, traffic conditions, and travel times. And the state expects its Monitor program will help. Monitor is the freeway traffic management system that includes closed-circuit television cameras that feed live video to the kiosks, websites, and safety officials, such as the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Department. Monitor also includes ramp meters. Ramp meters help to increase space between vehicles entering the freeway reducing the congestion caused by merging vehicles. Ramp meters help increase travel speeds and capacity. Monitor also includes overhead message signs. Overhead message signs advise drivers of travel times and impending congestion so they can make informed decisions about their travel routes. Along with Monitor, the DOT has constructed 14 crash investigation sites along this corridor. Drivers are asked to consider a number of alternatives during northbound Highway 45 construction Use public transit or carpool. Use alternate routes. Avoid US 45 during peak hours. Businesses can promote flex time and telecommuting. City expenses related to freeway work are paid by the state. Yeah, the state is providing a mitigation contract for us, so they've provided us funds to implement any traffic signal, pavement markings, or signing changes that we have to make to accommodate that traffic. The state's also providing funding for extra police enforcement. There will be extra patrols out around the freeway to control the extra traffic that's diverted off the system. The northbound lanes of I-894 south of the work zone and Zoo Interchange may see the worst congestion. That's due to traffic uh, 
in the northbound lanes being affected by the ongoing construction. Traffic uh, coming out of Milwaukee into the zoo interchange will be affected by the reduction of one lane northbound through the interchange, which will affect eastbound and westbound I-94 and also northbound 894. So motorists should expect that there will be more congestion than what they experienced last year. But for the next 10 to 12 years after this is completed, we will have a very smooth driving surface, safe facility for the motorists. The meeting of the Milwaukee Common Council will now come to order. Will the city clerk please call the roll? Alderman Heron. You will usually hear the 17 elected members of the Milwaukee Common Council debating the issues of the day in the council chambers at City Hall. But area high school students took to the floor recently to show off their debating skills in what is called a student congress. Students are doing legislation and they're acting as congressmen, so what more fitting than an actual room where legislation is debated and discussed. The five schools taking part in this mock legislative assembly submitted 36 proposed pieces of legislation. Students from each delegation selected eight to be debated and voted on. The choices ranged from proposals to mandate recess and eliminate rap music, to censorship, capital punishment, or raising the minimum wage by one dollar. Inflation has continued to rise and there's just not enough money to go around. When you adjust the current minimum wage, currently it falls to $4.90 an hour, but if inflation continues, it will fall even lower. Raising the minimum wage will offer many advantages. We ought not make the minimum wage an attractive job offer. What we need to do is take some time, implement adult education programs to work to get adults who are the sole breadwinners of their families off minimum wage. It's pretty cool because, you know, it really kind of challenges you in some ways because you, very, you have to be very analytical, you have to critically think. You can't just go up there and be like, oh, I don't like this, so we shouldn't do it. You have to really give reasons. And your goal is to ultimately persuade and even perhaps convince somebody that you're on the right side. So it's very challenging at points, but it's a great deal of fun at the same time. There is a lot of preparation that goes into it. You do want to do your research and get statistics, maybe questions and um, things to spark off that. You can't really go into it not knowing anything. You have to be knowledgeable of the subject. It's a great way for students to practice their oral and verbal articulation skills and their critical thinking skills. Talk about thinking on your feet. Uh, acting as a congressman is definitely it. Our welfare system has been one of the huge, uh, one of the, the biggest waste of money in our country's history. We have spent $9.1 trillion in the period from 1963 to 1998. This has come as part of our war on poverty, which kind of like our war on drugs has failed quite miserably. Charity today does not have the adequate funding to fund and help all those people on welfare. Many people who are on welfare are in the urban communities, and there are not enough urban um, organizations out there that can provide the adequate funding. As it says, $9.1 trillion in 1998, not too many organizations can fund $9.1 trillion to help this out. Oh, it teaches kids so many positive things about dealing with people. It is a, a program that in an activity that lasts their entire life. We've had kids come back to Marquette High School and say, you know, I really aced my college interview because of forensics. A student congress is usually held in a library or large classroom, but this time it was in the ornate and historic council chambers of City Hall. Over 100 years old, the largest city council chamber in the United States. Classic columns around the room highlight a Latin phrase, denoting a virtue of civil government. The many decorative elements portray the theme of human endeavor and progress. What does it mean to debate in this environment? This is truly exciting. Most of the time we're just kind of pitched up in some library or some you know, utility closet over to the side, kind of thrown together. And this is it's actually really cool because it makes you feel like you're really kind of legislating. You're really in a political environment. It's very well organized and it just really has the kind of environment that really is conducive to this kind of activity. It's really exciting. It's very, you really get the feeling that you really are a senator or representative. And 
all vital lifelong communication skills. Wisconsin Avenue has always figured prominently in the history of the Avenue's West neighborhood. It served as one of the Wisconsin Territory's earliest highways, seen here around 1890. This is how that same stretch looks today. Milwaukee's early prosperous pioneers established their homes along the thoroughfare, then known as Spring Street. One of them is the Pettibone Mansion at 20th and Wisconsin. This is considered the oldest building on Wisconsin Avenue. And Sylvester Pettibone was a farmer. And this was his original farmhouse at that time. And they talk about about 1852. Sylvester Pettibone was also a postmaster, bridge tender, road builder. His once modest house was part of a 250 acre farm. Some of the original rooms do not look as they did in 1852. But the building certainly is a treasure for the city. The addition in 1870 was done by, as I said, Mr. White. And he wanted to create a more ornate parlor room for um, his family. So they added on a very large section to the house. When they added the addition, though, to the building in 1870, the floors didn't necessarily line up. So all of that part of the building has a couple of steps up to each of the rooms. About 1902, even more drastic changes. A new porch, two stories high, and the entire roof line was changed. The present look arrived in the 1960s for the mansion, now a professional office building. The nearby Pabst Mansion and the Pettibone are among the last reminders of why Wisconsin Avenue was named the Grand Avenue in the late 1880s. Here are some other reasons. The Avenue's West neighborhood of today includes the area from I-43 to 27th Street, from Clybourne to Highland. It includes the Marquette neighborhood featured in an earlier report. Neighborhood attractions include the former Eagles Club, built in 1927, once the largest lodge in the country. The former Grand Avenue Congregational Church, now the Irish Cultural and Heritage Center. Nestled into the earth, the energy-efficient Central United Methodist Church. There are probably more apartments in Avenue West than anything else, some 4,000 units. Many built at a time when housing was needed for Marquette students and workers from six hospitals which once had campuses in the area. Housing problems and crime helped damage the area's reputation, but it's being turned around with a push from the Avenue's West Association and Business Improvement District. They were the part of the core of property owners and business operators who were determined that this neighborhood was going to uh, turn around and become the vital neighborhood that it had been many years prior. Um, and I think they've come a long way in that direction. Residents are also getting much of the credit for helping to improve avenues west. Property values are up. The crime rate is down. The crime rate just continues to drop precipitously in this neighborhood. Uh, we always exceed the city averages and decreases. And that's through a lot of hard work and a lot of collaborative work. That collaboration includes Milwaukee police officers who work out of a substation at 21st and Wells security officers from Marquette and Sinai Samaritan Hospital, business and apartment owners. I was born on 26th and Wells uh, and lived there uh, in the same place until I went off to college. And then came back to Milwaukee 
about five years later and been working in the area ever since. In addition to owning apartment buildings, Bass has also located his business in Avenues West. He says landlords are helping to improve the quality of residential housing. The neighborhood certainly has had its downs and uh, we're looking for it to, to be on the upswing. We can see that uh, people are living in their apartments longer. It's no longer a transient neighborhood as such. At one time, uh, leases were a very hard thing to work with. Now everybody who comes into our building signs a one-year lease. It assures one of the things that you really want to be able to give to a, uh, a resident is a good neighbor. And if you can give them a good neighbor, that's about half the battle. The many institutions in Avenues West, such as the former Sinai Samaritan West campus, help shape the neighborhood. They are now helping to reshape it. The former campus now houses a charter school. Other initiatives are underway for the 17-acre site. Apartment styles may also change. And that the housing today has a lot of efficiency in one-bedroom apartments where really family-type units are, are really what's needed. With a little creativity, apartments can be changed to uh, larger units. Uh, that's going to take some time. Marquette University played a major role in the area's revitalization with its $50 million Campus Circle project. The city helped with a targeted investment neighborhood, providing homeowners and landlords low-interest loans to improve housing. There's also hope for empty lots. I look at those empty lots and I look at board-up buildings and to me, I see opportunities. Other people can drive by and they'll say, oh gee, that's kind of depressing. And I'm not a Pollyanna by any stretch of the imagination, but I look at those and I know what can happen there and what will happen. Everyone has come together to work to decrease crime, to increase the property values, to work on their properties, to enhance them. And that's what a neighborhood does. And this is a really a neighborhood. If I was to paraphrase what our purpose is, is to make the neighborhood a better place to live, to work, and to visit. And not one of last choice, but a first choice. We think that's happening now. But it's gradual. There's not a rush of movement to the area. But we see a good future here. This is an area with a rich history and architecture. An area with problems, but one determined to succeed. You know, so what do you do with all that housing? What do you do for employment for people? What is your, your source of economic vitality? That's the challenge. That's meeting the people in this neighborhood. And they're rising to the challenge.